It is time for question time to the Minister for Social Development, Mr Mervyn Storey, and I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, question number one. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. The Housing Executive administers the Disabled Facilities Grant, which makes a significant impact on the lives of those living with a disability in the private sector, helping them to make adaptations to their homes. In 2014-15, the Housing Executive approved over 1,200 Disabled Facility Grants and expended over £12 million in grant assistance. This year to date, 537 applications have been received and almost 500 Disabled Facility Grant applications have been approved. These grant applications address issues such as access to premises, downstairs bathroom, wet room and downstairs bedrooms. The dialogue for supplementary. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, I listen very carefully to, to the, the Minister. And I congratulate the Housing Executive on the work they have done. But would the Minister agree with me that very often time is not on the side of people who need the disability uh, facilities grants? And many of them may well be uh, bed blocking in hospitals. How does the Minister propose to clear that waiting list so that those people are not in long queues that they cannot afford to be in? Member for his uh, supplementary. And obviously, when you come to this issue, not only is, does it become an issue of the budget which is allocated, but it becomes an issue of the process that is used. Uh, and I'm well aware, not only in terms of uh, the issue in regards to my position as Minister with responsibility, however, uh, that is important, but also as a local MLA. And like yourself, I'm well aware of constituents who, because the process can be somewhat uh, protracted, and particularly if you're dependent on a report which will come from occupational therapy, and you're waiting for all of those particular elements to be in, uh, in a row. What I can assure uh, the member is that under reviews, as uh, you're well aware, in all of these issues, uh, departments uh, have a review of the, pra the practice and the process. That is an element which I am more than happy to give further consideration to, because we are often criticised in this House for uh, what we have not done. But I think for those uh, people that we referred to in the substantive reply in relation to the original question, uh, given the fact that we have approved over 1,200 disabled facility grants, and expended well over the £12 million in that grant assistance. That has made an invaluable contribution to the well-being and to the livelihood and to the day-to-day -day experience of those people who suffered with uh, a disability. But I will uh, certainly give uh, further consideration to the comments that the Minister has made, particularly uh, with her colleagues in occupational therapy and the other component parts which makes up the decision-making process in relation to this. Well, Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Following on from the, the supplementary from Mr. Dallet, has the Minister any indication how, when a family with a newborn child with disabilities actually needs a new home due to maybe needing a, a, an additional bedroom to supply a wet room or change of facilities to keep medical equipment in, is the Minister any way how that process can also be worked with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive so there is a parallel process? as to allocating a new house as well as processing the disability grant? Yes, I thank the member for the, for the, the supplementary. And obviously, uh, there is an element of this sometimes where it uh, unfortunately has to look beyond the confines of the housing executive and has to look maybe at a provision which is in a housing association. I can think of one particular uh, case at this minute in time which has been protracted for far too long. And I have, uh, as minister, uh, try to expedite it uh, as quickly as we possibly can, uh, where a family, a very large family with children who have uh, particular disabilities, have not been able to get appropriate housing. Uh, there has been a number of locations that have been looked at. However, it has gone on too long, and I just had a meeting last week with the Chief Executive of the Housing Association in relation to this. And it does sometimes end up going into housing associations as much as to the housing executive. But it, is, it really is similar to what I said to, to Mr Dallet. None of us know 
uh, what is going to face us in the weeks and months ahead, what the difficulties we may face as families. I, at the moment, have a particular personal uh, issue in relation to my own father, who has just come out of hospital after a protracted length of time in hospital. Uh, and there is going to be a need whereby uh, additional resources are going to have to be looked at how his needs are going to be met. How much more that is the case when it is particularly children with disability? It is an issue, and I'm quite happy to include the issue of the children with disability uh, and how they are provided for in a new bill situation in the consideration that we give to how we continue to make progress in relation to this issue. Before I call Mrs. Dolores Kelly, I must inform the House that question number five has been withdrawn. Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Question number two, Minister. The response to the public consultation on a new regulatory framework for social housing was published on the Department for Social Development's website on the 30th of September 2015. And it is planned to issue the final framework document early in the new year. Implementation will commence during 2016-17. Ms. Kelly, for a supplement. Thank the minister for his response. And, and the, I wonder, could he give us uh, some indicators of, of how he is thinking and taking forward in terms of implementation? What are some of the key emerging trends uh, that he wants to act upon? Well, obviously, uh, we want to ensure that uh, maybe we should set some context in relation to this, because the department regulates the work of all social housing providers uh, in Northern Ireland and uses a regulatory framework to do so. And in light of the changes within the housing sector within the last few years and the reviews of regulatory frameworks in other jurisdictions, it was decided to look again uh, at this uh, framework. The consultation document outlined proposals for a new regulatory framework, and the regulations will be carried out against three standards – the consumer, governance and finance. And obviously, that then will bring us into the area of looking at risk-based processes. An element of flexibility will be built in to accommodate variations in organisations such as size, development plans, previous history and business complexity. And that gives, uh, an indication of the breadth of what we are seeking to achieve. Although I have to say, and I know the member takes a, a particular interest in this issue, uh, it is a challenging uh, process that we are setting ourselves because of the vastness of the sector and because of the particular challenges that we face. Mr. Adrian McQuillan. I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Minister, how did the Department decide what to include in this framework? Uh, in terms of how we went about uh, to uh, what we included, the department looked at best practice, and sometimes it's always good to, well, maybe not always good to look at uh, practice in other jurisdictions because there's an underlying assumption that everybody else gets it right somewhere else. That may not always be the case, and I think sometimes when it comes to look at, at best practice, Northern Ireland sometimes uh, leads the way in many of these things in the way that we uh, approach the issue. But we looked at best practice in other jurisdictions and compared these against our current controls in Northern Ireland. And many representatives from the Housing Association movement were also involved with workshops taken forward under the Social Housing Reform Programme before the consultation was published. And clearly, the contribution was key in the development of the new framework. And those issues that were raised are issues that we have tried to incorporate as we move forward. Well, Mr. Frau uh, Last one, question three. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker. As the member will appreciate, the Urban Villages Initiative is being led by the Office of the First and the Deputy First Minister. DSD has been supporting Urban Villages initiatives through submitting a bid for funding at the June monitoring round early in May for a number of uh, the projects, both in Belfast and in Londonderry, uh, totalling £2.1 million. The projects were identified along with the estimated cost by the Strategic Investment Board. My department is also supporting the Urban Village Initiative by assisting the Office of the First and the Deputy First Minister and the Strategic Investment Board, where possible, in the delivery of a number of these projects within the current financial year, and that work is currently ongoing. 
Mr McCann for a supplementary. And I thank the Minister for his uh, question thus far. Uh, there are many uh, areas throughout the North who are eagerly, eagerly awaiting uh, the, the, the urban villages. Uh, could you give me some uh, maybe outline? Uh, are there others that, that, that are closer uh, to taking off than, than, than some others? Um, is there any time frame set uh, that will give people confidence that they are going to take place in the first place? Yes, I think that obviously there has been, uh, and this hasn't been uh, a process that hasn't been fraught with its challenges. And I think uh, in some communities there has been a challenge to try and, uh, in a sense, get an understanding of what really was trying to be achieved in relation to the ur urban village concept. There could be opportunities under the UFMD FM urban, urban Villages initiative to bid for funding through future government monitoring rounds, and that's something that we uh, are looking at to see uh, how we could progress that. In terms of uh, the, what, what I want to see is progress being made on the ones that we've originally identified, because I think if we do that, then we will be more successful in how we could use this as a, a useful means in the future. Through the gin monitoring round, 500,000 was allocated to London Derry, 400,000 uh, to East Side, and 1.2 million to the Collin Town Centre Urban Village uh, to complete a number of projects. And my department will continue to progress the work within its control to maximise the spend in this particular financial year. Well, Mr. Nelson McCausland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, could I ask the Minister if he would outline for us? Uh, in some uh, description or other, the, the projects that are currently being taken forward in the various urban village areas um, across the province. Thank the, the member for his supplementary. Uh, the staff within DSD are currently working in partnership, as I've said to the original question, with MDFM and the Strategic Investment Board and a number of schemes, and there are various stages of design and procurement. In the Newton Arge Road area, there are seven schemes ongoing, including uh, pocket parks, artwork, domestic frontages, and other public realm and environmental improvements. In the Collin area, there is a plan for a large scale play park with an overall cost, as I've indicated, at $1.2 million. Uh, in Ballysillan, and I've no doubt that the member will be interested in that particular uh, location, and Ardoin and Sandy Row, Donegal Pass, and the Markets Urban Village areas, engagement with the local communities is being taken forward by the SIB to identify the potential project proposals. There are six projects being taken forward uh, in the Bogside and the Fountain Urban Village area in 2015 16, including two public realm schemes shop frontage improvements, play park, renovation of a community centre, traffic safety initiatives. In addition, there are a number of longer-term proposals being developed. And I trust that gives the member and other members some sense of the diversity uh, of what can be included and what can be uh, delivered under the, this concept of urban village. And for those that have engaged in those particular areas, I think they find it to be, yes, challenging, but I think rewarding when they see progress and an outcome which enhances their community. Mr. Leslie Craig. Deputy Speaker, the Minister has mentioned there the costs of the initiative. Does he agree that the lack of any clarity about how much funding would be available has actually led to a very low uptake of, of projects, uh, as he demonstrated quite clearly there, outside the two cities? I thank the member for the supplementary, and obviously, you know, it would be nice if we were able to have additional resource for many of these projects. And there's always a sense sometimes when you come to uh, deliver and even look at the planning of projects like this that there's never enough money in the, the particular fund. And I am very conscious of the issue that there's a perception that somehow this can become a very uh, city-based uh, initiative uh, and that other areas outside the confines of uh, Belfast and Londonderry do not become the beneficiaries of it. That is something that we need to take cognizance of. Uh, but again, uh, I, like other ministers, uh, am constrained by the financial restraints that are placed 
upon my budget, and I know we have had that debate in this House on numerous occasions in the past. And I do not think any minister is ever satisfied with the total amount of money that they receive. And this is one project that, if there was additional funding was made available to, uh, it would be given serious consideration to address the point that the member raises. Well, Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for the Urban Villages' support for a cross-community youth project in their East Belfast that led to the reinstallation of the Teenage Dreams public artwork, a good example of that project in action. And given that the Urban Villages is a headline project of the Northern Ireland Good Relations strategy building a united community, can I ask the Minister what key good relations outcomes it will achieve for our community? Well, I think the member, in a sense, has, has alluded to, uh, he's almost answered his own question in terms of that issue of involvement and that issue of engagement. If you get a community that feels disengaged, if you get a community that feels that it doesn't have the infrastructure and the environment in which it can uh, build even relationships within its own community, let alone having the strength and the capacity to be able to go beyond the confines of its own area, then I think that is something which we have to welcome. And I have gone and visited uh, during my time in office a variety of projects and the way in which those projects make an invaluable contribution, first and foremost, to their own local area. And I think if we can instill uh, in our local communities a sense of pride, and it is sad that there are some areas in Northern Ireland where still having a sense of pride in your local community is not a priority the way that it should be. However, with initiatives such as Urban Village, it doesn't have all the answers, but where you see progress and where you see very tangible outcomes, then I think that enhances that opportunity for communities to move forward and to actually have confidence that their area is a place where they want to live, bring up their children, and an area where others can interact with them in a very positive way. Mr Jerry Kelly. I've got the privilege from Colia Kester Carter. Question four, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and the, and the member for the question. The department's preferred developer for the proposed Northside Regeneration Scheme, Northside Regeneration Limited, submitted an outline planning application for a comprehensive mixed-use scheme comprising 10 sites at the end of June 2015. Applications for the approval of reserve matters for the individual sites are to be submitted in due course. A full planning application has already been submitted in relation to Site 3. Once the applications have been determined and after consultation with Belfast City Council, the Department will need to be satisfied that there are sufficient financial resources behind the developer to ensure the completion of the scheme and that the regeneration benefits of the development merit the adoption of a statutory development scheme. Mr. Kelly for a supplementary. I go on Bricus Lesson, I'll hand Frank with you, Shaw. Thank you, Minister, for his uh, answer up to now. Uh, he, he will be aware this is a very substantial scheme, and uh, I just wanted to ask him, Minister, after listening to him there, does he have any plans to meet? Uh, there's a substantial number of traders who will be affected, as well as residents in the area, and they have uh, some considerable concerns. They want the regeneration of the area, but they have some considerable concerns. Uh, has he met them, or does he intend to meet them? I have endeavoured, as, uh, as I trust the member knows, uh, and I know other members are aware of this, that uh, where there are particular issues raised and concerns, I have endeavoured to meet whoever it is wants to come and have a conversation with us. I do have a concern, and the concern is that the focus needs to be very clearly on the huge benefit of the investment into that particular part of the city. Uh, the member will be aware that I have had discussions uh, with other executive colleagues because on the uh, plans moving forward for that particular part of the city, you could estimate that there is somewhere in the region of a billion pounds worth of investment. And I want, and I think my executive colleagues want, and I think the members for the area would like to see that there is a concerted, planned, coordinated approach to not only what is happening in relation to Northside, but also what is being planned uh, by 
other elements of the executive, whether it be through DRD, whether it be through the work of the relocation of the university and others, to make sure that we maximise to the benefit of the people in the area and to those organisations their investment. Yeah. If there are particular uh, traders who have uh, issues, which I'm, I haven't met and I can't recall that I've specifically met traders, more than happy to meet them and more than happy to listen to the concerns that they want to raise. Ms. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Um, in an earlier answer to Mr. Kelly, you had mentioned consultation with Belfast City Council. Um, can I ask the Minister, uh, do you know at this stage what their position is on the North Side um, development? Well, obviously, the, the issue in relation to Belfast City Council is, is an important issue, and I thank the member for raising it for a number of reasons. But first of all, Belfast City Council officers have worked with my department on this issue from the outset, beginning with the selection uh, of the Northside uh, Regeneration Limited. Officials have suggested to officers at the City Council that in view at this stage of the process from elected members would be helpful and that the request has been currently considered. And, and I have said this on a number of occasions. This cannot be something which is imposed by my department. It has to be done in consultation with the Council. It has to be done in consultation with the local community. It has to be done in consultation with the public representatives, because we all have a vested interest in ensuring that we get the best outcome. And that's why and I've given that assurance uh, repeatedly in this House, but I would give this warning. And it's, it's, not a, it's not a warning with a threat or, or anything which is me trying to, in any way, undermine this process. But we do need to make decisions in relation to where this is all going. Because I do have a concern that the, uh, those that would financially be behind this, at some point in time, may feel these processes are too uh, long, they are taking too long, they are too protracted, and that they could decide to take their investment and place it somewhere else other than in this great city. Mr. Alban McGuinness. Thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his detailed answers. Uh, and quite clearly, everyone is supportive of the Minister in trying to get investment into this area. So do the local residents and so do the local business folk. But the problem is this, that as far as the business people are concerned, they believe that uh, the plan as it presently exists uh, does not attract investment into the area. And in fact, it is doing the opposite at the moment. It is actually deterring investment. Therefore, there must be a speedy outcome to all of this so that there can be a clear idea of what's going to happen in that area in the near future. And, and I thank the member for, for that uh, supplementary. And I will take on board that comment, and, and it follows on from the comment that was made by uh, the, the member also from West Belfast. And that is, I do not want to have a situation where there is, whether it's an element of uh, the business community or the, the local community that will have to live with the consequences of all that is going on. Let's remember there is a considerable amount of activity already going on. And one of the points that, that I have made as well is that we will either have in this process using Northside and using the various uh, statutory instruments that are at our disposal to have a, a controlled process other than what could potentially become the situation, and that is uh, an uncontrolled situation where already, as I've already said in the substantive reply that I gave at the beginning, you have a number of applications which are already uh, approved. And we know the concerns, and I have listened to the concerns that people have about uh, student accommodation and all of that. But if we don't get an overarching process and some degree of not control for the sake of it that it that satisfies the bureaucracy of the civil service, but a control that manages the process that gives us the outcome in the best possible interest of traders, residents and of the people of uh, that particular part of, of Belfast. Mr Stephen Moutry. Uh, I uh, thank the 
member for his question. In order to help address identified housing need in Upper Balm, there are currently 50 new housing units under construction in Lurgan and Portadown area, which will be completed during this financial year. A further 52 units are programmed to start on site this year, with an additional 80 units programmed to start in 2016-17. The remaining housing need is expected to be addressed either through the re-letting re of existing stock or the refurbishment of void properties in the area. For supplement. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank uh, the Minister for his response. Can I further ask him then what sites in Upper Ban are currently under construction? I thank the member for his uh, supplementary. And I think before I give the detail, I think that uh, I've come to this House on many occasions and given the responsibility that I have for housing. I would lo love to be in a position where in Northern Ireland we were doing more. If there is one thing that has become for me uh, an interest and, and a passion, and that is that we, we could really do something with housing in Northern Ireland. And when we look at the specific in relation to uh, the uh, area that the member represents, 38 social housing units currently under construction in the Lurgan area, <coughs> with 12 units in the Portadown area. Now, for those who will be uh, beneficiary of those particular units, that is welcome. But there is a huge issue of demand. There is a huge issue of other areas where we would like to be doing more. And I trust that in the days and weeks ahead, we can uh, really give a focus on to moving the debate on to a housing agenda which gives to the people of Northern Ireland good quality homes, as I have no doubt those that have been already delivered in Upper Ban have, and that the ones that are currently in sight will do. Mrs. Dolores Kelly. Speaker, and I'm sure the Minister will acknowledge that the number of houses being built is just the tip of the iceberg of those that are required. But Minister, you, you will be familiar with the Mount Zion and indeed the, the demand in the North Lurgan area in particular for to, uh, units for older people. I wonder, Minister, would you agree to meet with the delegation from Mount Zion for an exciting proposal they have to transform the current arrangement they have with choice from young persons' dwellings to those for older people? Yes, uh, I have already uh, met with representatives from Mount Zion, which was facilitated through uh, my colleague Mr Mutry, but I have no difficulty uh, in meeting a further delegation. The Northern Ireland Housing Executive has not approved a proposed supporting people scheme at Mount Zion, as you know. The Department uh, has engaged with the Shankill Lurgan Community Project and Choice Housing Ireland Limited to consider alternative housing options at Mount Zion. And I have to say, in a recent correspondence which I received from them, I'm encouraged that they have taken what can only be said as, as, a, as a very proactive approach. And let me place on record our appreciation, and I know that the members from the Upper Ban constituency will endorse this, of the work that's carried out by Mount Zion. And uh, the, the question that I have repeatedly asked through this process and in others, if they were not there and delivering the service that they have delivered, the statutory system could not pick up that particular provision. So I want to be of help. I welcome the fact that they have uh, had some uh, interesting outcomes with uh, Habitat, Habitat for Humanity. I think that is uh, good progress, but that should not be so that some other organisations providing the need, and we are abdicating our responsibility, and I am happy to have a further meeting in relation to the issue. I have an indication from two other speakers that they wish to question the Minister. Before I call Mr Ian Milne, I would remind the member that this is a need for social housing in Upper Ban, so therefore a specific question on the constituency of Upper Ban. And could I thank the, the, the principal speaker and the minister for his answer thus far. And this question is about the upper ban. How many uh, new social homes will be required to be built in upper ban between now and 2020 uh, to address the, the current housing need? It always amazes me how members can be inventive to move from one constituency to another. But there you are. The Housing Executive has identified a total projected housing need for the Upper Ban area to be 228 units over the period of 14 to 19. I remind Mr Ross Hussey of the same. 
Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, could the Minister advise how many properties have been transferred from the ownership of the Northern Ireland Housing Executive to housing associations in Upper Ban? Uh, I do not have that information with me, but I assure the member that I will write to him to give him, and I will also copy it to his colleague who is absent from Upper Ban. <laughs> That brings us to the end of uh, question time for listed questions. We now move to topical questions. I call Mr Roy Beggs. The, um, the minister My apologies. Turned too many sheets at the one time. I call Ms Dolores Kelly. Uh, Minister, you will be aware of uh, the dreadful murder of uh, Mr Seeley in the Dingwell Park area of Tignavon and the clamour for that, that, those flats to be demolished. I wonder, uh, Minister, would the uh, Minister and the, uh, the Housing Exec be sympathetic to that demand, given that those are, that particular area has been a breeding ground for antisocial behaviour for many, many years? Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and to the member for her supplementary. Can I first of all pass on my condolences to the family of Marcel Seeley following uh, the tragic death and murder in that particular uh, place? I think uh, it was uh, extremely sad, uh, and we know that there is uh, someone who is currently uh, being arrested in relation to that particular issue. I'm also aware of the residents' concern. Uh, including the member who has raised this, this issue with me surrounding the antisocial behaviour in the Ding Dingwall Flats and have been assured by the Housing Executive of their continued commitment to deal robustly with the issues in the estate. I also recently met with Minister O'Dowd and the Deputy Mayor Catherine Seeley of Armagh City, Bambridge and Craig Avonborough Council to discuss the matters and have given an undertaking to them, as I will do to the member today, to discuss the issues of the Housing Executive to see what more can be done. I have to say the issue in Dingwell Flats is not unfortunately uncommon. And I think that we unfortunately have identified a particular issue which is of a concern to me as Minister responsible for housing. And that is placing people into locations without any of the appropriate necessary supports and then we see the consequences of what happens. And I have heard uh, from the member and from others particular harrowing stories of what uh, it can be like. And for the neighbouring area, which is a settled community, and the difficulty that that creates. And so I have had a, a brief discussion with uh, the Chief Executive of the Housing Executive in relation to the issue, and I plan to have a further meeting uh, with the Housing Executive, particularly in relation to this location. Call Mrs. Kelly for a supplementary. The Deputy Speaker, and I welcome uh, the Minister's insight and indeed acknowledgement that uh, what happened at Dingwell Park was horrific, but not an isolated incident uh, in terms of uh, antisocial behaviour and vulnerable people being placed within settled communities. Minister, I just wonder then, in terms of supporting people and moving forward and the review uh, that was recently conducted of supporting people, are there any lessons to be learned or any amendments that could be made that would actually assist? Uh, and direct resources uh, to, to those type of situations where people do need a bit of extra help. The member's right to identify as a key element of, of the way in which we address these particular issues is, and that is one element of it, and that is the review that we've currently carried out in relation to supporting people. I, as Minister, when I came into office, gave a very public commitment, and not only in word but in deed, that supporting people would receive uh, the uh, protection in relation to its budget, and we did, uh, even though there was a huge challenge uh, for us to deliver that, we delivered that in relation to the budget. We have now had a review of supporting people. I am uh, continuing to look at that particular document to see uh, how you, have we covered all the areas and, and if there are lessons, and undoubtedly uh, and regrettably that there are lessons that we need to learn, then we will see how we can give assurance to public representatives, but I think also particularly to communities, that when we talk about supporting people, 
That's really what we do. And I know the real value of supporting people when I've seen it played out in practice to many uh, families. But there may be, as there always is in these situations, elements of it which could be delivered better. That was why we initiated the review, and I have given the undertaking. The review was not about trying to give a fundamental change in the delivery of supporting people. It was actually to enhance its delivery and to make it more beneficial to the people that it's there to support. Call Mr. Peter Weir. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update on the public realm schemes within North Town? Well, I thank the member for his uh, question in relation to North Down. I'm sure he would be delighted to know uh, that over the past five years uh, there has been an investment in the area of almost 18.3 million in a number of major capital regeneration schemes in the North Down area, including the public realm enhancement in Bangor, Hollywood, Cumber, Donoghadee and Newtonards. Uh, and uh, 20, almost £21 million pound schemes, of which Ards and North Down Borough Council have invested uh, £10 million, represents the largest commitment by any council to the public realm uh, investment and improvement scheme. These schemes will upgrade the commercial core of the town centres to encourage greater public use and to stimulate investment. And I've witnessed at first hand the positive impact that these initiatives have had in restoring life into the town centres and city centres. The works in each of the town centres will include the installation of new footpaths uh, in natural stone paving, new street lighting, furniture, landscaping and associated works. The Hollywood scheme was recently completed and the Cumber and Donoghue D are due to complete within the next few weeks. And I know that will please my uh, colleague from uh, the constituency as well. Yeah. Well, Mr. Weir, first Minister, supplementary. Yes, can I ask the Minister to confirm up that the, in terms of the Bangor scheme, we welcome the completion that has taken place, but that in terms of the Bangor scheme, it's due for completion uh, on track in terms of time scale as well? It seems you know that all politics is even local when it even comes to constituencies, and it, it gets very, very parochial. Uh, can I assure the member that the Bangor and Newton Arch schemes are on target to complete in the summer of 2016? But can I say something which I think is, is, can be easily said in a response to a question on a written piece of paper? And that is, if you look at the amount of money that was contributed by the local council, it is the largest con contribution of any of our local councils, uh, at somewhere in the region of almost £11 million. Uh, and I think that is not only a commitment of central government, but it's also a commitment and the focus and attention of local government. And both together, when you put those two together, you get a good outcome. And I think other councils uh, should have a look yeah. at uh, what uh, has been achieved in the North Down, and I better make sure that I get it right, the Ards and North Down Borough Council area. Because in this new age, in this new age of the new councils, you have to make sure that your terminology is correct. I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what he and his department are doing in preparation for the arrival of the first uh, number of Syrian refugees to Northern Ireland? I thank the member for his uh, question. And obviously, this is uh, an issue which is uh, regrettably very topical. And we would prefer that we weren't in the situation. Uh, that we were in. And I think, and I want to preface what I'm going to say uh, by again trying to bring this House and our community in Northern Ireland to a place of reality. We are dealing here with real people, real families, and real issues. Yes, uh, we can raise a, a, a varied number of, of particular issues, but I think we need to, first of all, preface what we say that we are dealing with real people here. My department is leading the operational planning group, which is putting in place the arrangements to manage the arrival of Syrian refugees into Northern Ireland. The two main areas where the work of my department will be affected by the arrival of Syrian refugees in Northern Ireland are the processing of benefits by the Social Security Agency and the provision of housing uh, for those who come. Refugees who come to Northern Ireland under the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme will be entitled to welfare benefit on the same basis as UK citizens. 
Social Security Agency is committed to providing whatever support it can for those being resettled here and is well advanced in the planning to ensure these cases are proceeded as smoothly as possible. My department has also engaged with Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs to make arrangements for the processing of tax credits and child benefit alongside the benefits administered by the Social Security Agency. And the department, uh, along with the Housing Executive, uh, has st uh, started work to identify locations uh, which may be suitable in taking into account the availability of suitable housing and the capacity in key public services such as education, health. And given the pressures on the social housing waiting lists, it is inspected that the housing solution will mainly make use of the private rented sector. I remind the Minister of the two-minute rule and call Lord Morrow for supplementary. Yeah, I thank the Minister for that very comprehensive <laughs> response. Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, can I ask the Minister further in relation to that? You speak there about a, an operational planning group, and I suspect your department is leading on that. Can you tell us who else is involved in that? Yeah, and uh, can I say to the Principal Deputy Speaker, I appreciate his his warning in relation to that. I think given the seriousness of the issue, it was important that I place on record in the House because this is the first opportunity that we have been able to do that at uh, question time, uh, this particular issue. And I have seen in the local press recently particular criticisms coming from some local councils in relation to this process. I can give them an assurance, as I give this House an assurance today, that we will continue to do uh, as speedily as we can process this particular issue. The member asked in relation to the operational planning group. It has a wide membership, including all public agencies who may be required to provide services to refugees, local government and organisations in the voluntary sector who have expertise in this field. And so, if you bring those various groups together, I believe that that gives us the core of the operational planning group, and that is where the focus uh, is currently at the moment. Call Mr. Sean Rogers. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Minister, on the back of a serious incident in Newcastle at the weekend, um, what steps are being taken by DSD to ensure full sharing of antisocial behaviour information between the PSNI and housing associations? Thank you, Member, for his uh, supplementary. And obviously, there is always a concern when particular incidents take place. Uh, since 2000, November of 2004, an information, an information sharing protocol with the PSNI has been in place and is being used successfully across a range of housing services, including the gathering of information and the development of cases where it is the intention of the executive to take legal action, and the gathering of information and the development of cases where it is the intention of the executive to take legal action to secure injunctions or antisocial uh, behaviour orders against an, indivi an individual, and when considering an applicant's eligibility and entitlement to homeless assistance or housing accommodation. The purpose of the protocol is to facilitate the sharing of data where appropriate between the housing executive and the PSNI in order to detect the pay, the, uh, and prevent crime. And the protocol introduces and formalises services level delivery standards between the executive and the police. And the sharing of such information allows the agencies to work collaboratively and consider the appropriate remedies to address antisocial behaviour. Call Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Could I thank the Minister for that? Minister, there's a frustration out there among the good people that live in that particular state that the, the, the protocols are not nearly as robust as they were when it was the housing, housing executive and the PSNI. So, what lessons are learned from the previous protocols and how can it be tightened? Thank you. Thank the member for his question. In the light of the issue that the member raises on the particular incident, what I will give the member an assurance is that, and again, it, it goes back to the point I made earlier, it, it's relatively easy to read uh, in this House a particular answer to a specific question, but it doesn't sometimes always get to the, the bottom of a specific. And what I will do is that I will, in the light of the incident that the member has referred to, have this issue uh, referred to the, the executive, to the PSNI and also to the Housing Association so that we will again revisit the issue of the protocols and I will write to the member. Call Mr David McIlvey. Deputy Speaker, um, I wonder could the Minister provide uh, an update regarding the St Patrick's Barracks site in Ballymena? 
Uh, thank the member for uh, the uh, supplementary or for the, the topical. Uh, following the proposal uh, which I made to the First and Deputy First Minister for the development of the former military barracks for mixed public sector use, it was agreed that the site should be acquired by my department. A business case for the purchase of the site and for its development using a housing-led regeneration scheme was approved and the site was subsequently uh, bought uh, by the Department for Social Development on the 30th of September, just a few days ago. My department has appointed consultants to prepare to prepare a development uh, plan setting out the potential areas on the site which could be used by uh, public stakeholders. This development plan is expected to be completed uh, by the end of the month, if not sooner, uh, and a programme of work to prepare the site for development is now currently being considered. I have also given an assurance that I will uh, take into account, and indeed it is my intention, to meet with the local council, because, as I said, in relation to the public realm works that we have undertaken in uh, other jurisdictions and other council areas, it is vitally important that we have buy-in from the local council. And I have had already this week some preliminary discussions with the council, and I look forward uh, to developing what, what is in our constituency, and I speak not only as minister, but also uh, along with my colleague uh, that represents the North Antrim constituency, one of the most prestigious sites, and a site that has a huge history, and a history that we want to protect, and an area that I have no doubt will make an invaluable contribution to the livelihood and well-being of our constituents. That brings us to the end of topical questions to the Minister. We now 